Next speaker, Tia Sanchez. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm a structural geologist uh, and I've uh, been using MAC data, RAP data into my workflows uh, for a few years already. So, th this talk is more on the side of uh, traditional interpretation uh, with a strong focus on integrating data sets. Uh, not only data sets, not in a remote sense data sets, but a lot of field work as well. Yeah, so so uh, my main objective is to, to generate um, structural frameworks for exploration. Yeah. And for this, for this, um, I'll try to integrate as much data as possible. And Canada is a great place for that. Uh, there's plenty of data available, and most of the time people do not know how to get to the data, but there's plenty of it, um, which is which is great. It, it doesn't happen everywhere. So I'm gonna. Ask First, I'm gonna touch on. Sorry, I'm gonna touch on um, on uh, this uh, digital uh, smartphone er era. Um, I've been using a lot of this, the phone in the in the field, and this is also very nice because you can take the data with you in the field. It's quick, reliable, and it allows you to to interpret straight away when you are on the ground. So we're gonna have a look at a uh, quick look up on that where the data is coming from, and then two case studies in Western Canada, both of them in the intermontane terrains, um, one around Prince George area, and the other one in the Yukon. All right, so the basic layers uh, that we all use is basically uh, topography, which well, there's great topography nowadays, so, so the open topography website, uh, gives you the chance to download 30 meter resolution DMs. And the Germans are going to take now, probably in the next year or so, they're going to have 12 meter resolution DMs available for everyone. So there's great data there, and I'm not talking about Astro GTM data, it's all radar data. SRTM 30 is already released for the entire world, and the Japanese also have a 30 meter radar uh, data set for the entire world. Uh, then, well, with respect to the satellite images, there's plenty of uh, places here, you can, you know, sort of an endless task to put this thing together, but mainly the USGS has, uh, has uh, the Lancer date that we all know, uh, ESA has great data as well, and then obviously with respect to geophysics, um, well, the USGS and the provincial geological service in Canada, uh, they also have plenty of data, so, so those are the three basic layers, and there's, there's no, in my respect, there's no chance that you can interpret geophysics without having a decent DM. Um, so it's, it's worth uh, working with that as well. Okay, so this is the, the one of the final results of that project in the Quest area. This was done for Geoscience BC uh, maybe a year and a half ago. You can see there the layers of information and the final result, which can look very complex. A uh, lot of line tracing, MAC domains, and I'll go deeply into that later on. And this is the data that we use for the Yukon Gold project. This was an NDIU project, which also integrated a lot of field work um, with, with uh, DEM data, grab data, and MAC data. So going into this uh, smartphone era, which uh, most of most of you probably already have some of these apps in your phone, but I don't know how many of you actually use them as a work tool. There's two of them which are absolutely great, uh, easy to use, especially that one. It's just you just export a PDF map from your URGIS and you put it in your phone. You cannot switch between layers, but you got you can put together three or four different maps, one with a graph, one with a geology, one with a DEM, one with your structures. And you take it on the ground, you can put a pin in wherever you're standing, you take a picture, note, and then you move on. It's fast. Um, so you're doing chopper traverses, you know, this is a great thing to have. Uh, and the other one is film. And this is, this is what I've been using for the last maybe four years. Ah, and in regards of uh, hardware, 
Uh, there's, there's some of these fonts now that do carry pens, so you can trace your polygons, and you can export everything as shape files or um, vector files. So that's an example of, uh, of uh, me using the, the, this, uh, the Avanza PDF maps in Western uh, Turkey. There you see the Mendeleev score complex with its Myosin intrusions in the football of that uh, detachment fault. Um, there, and this was a field trip that I got last year for SCG. And this is what is it about. Just you know, points, photographs, samples, and then you move on quick. Two ways to use. And then the next one, it's, uh, it's what I use for uh, Clino. This is, this is from a very well known company in the oil industry um, from the UK. And uh, it has absolutely everything that you should have as a field note. Yeah. So you can, you can draft your notes, uh, you can use your pen, take pictures. All the pictures are oriented. Um, so it's basically a field notebook plus a structural compass, plus a stereo plot. Um, so what I've been doing for maybe the last year or so, I've been putting together the, um, in the different projects that I've been involved, um, uh, the structural setup and the ideological setup that is required for each project. For instance, here you can see you have a, you have a ideological table, a ideological chart, so you set up your lithologies of your project, everyone will be using the same lithologies. And on the other side as well, you can set up your structures that you're going to use in the field. If you're not in metamorphic terrains, so you're not going to put you know, tactile symbologies, it's just brittle stuff. And then you set up your symbologies for that, and everyone will be using the same thing. You export everything quickly as a KMZ file or as a CSV file to get to use it in ArcGIS. It's, it's a great tool. And it allows you know, to spend less time than um, you know, trespassing data from your notes and spend more time interpreting. All right, so now I'm going to go into the two case, uh, case studies. This, was, uh, this, this is the first one. This is already this is published uh, in 2015. It was a Geoscience BC um, work. I did it with uh, Thomas Bissick. Uh, which at that time he was at NDIU and with Peter Kowalczyk. So I do the interpretation uh, and Peter and I always you know, get together with geophysicists so they do the, um, the processing of the data. But, and we talk and we fluently talk which is what Ken was uh, uh, pushing forward. No? So this is all available and possible to download. So as well we, we have all this amazing, you know, raw data which is available, but there's also people that have interpreted this already and you can also download that. So this is this is great. Uh, uh, and geoscience we see that's a great work. That. So that's the area. It's the intermontane terrains there around Prince George is a big area. Interpretation was done one to four hundred thousand scale. So it's a very you know, initial approach to what we want to do. Most of the area is covered by superficial sediments, I would say well, 60% at the moment. So the idea was um, yeah, to, to, to get an interpretation to, into those areas, the areas which were covered. So you can see there, that's the, that's the quaternary drift, or the quaternary sediments, and we have uh, this highly prospectable area here and here, Mount Milligan and Mount Bolly uh, sitting right in the center and we have this ginormous cover of superficial sediments. So we wanted to know what was going on. Um, this is the second work that has been done uh, in this area. So this is you know, a, different, a different try on the same data sets um, which was already uh, Come to a different perspective. Right. So uh, Peter did this, did the, the filtering, and the one is mainly classical filtering with the, with the high pass and low pass filtering. But what we also did, uh, which I think it came out quite well, tried to uh, by using our continuous residuals, we tried to filter out whatever it was covering. Uh, that we were interested in. 
So in this case, the young basalts that cover broadly the area, especially in the valleys, and also the quaternary drift. So, so we, we upward continue the data in order to see a level of the crust that was, or try to get closer to a level of the crust that is below that. So, and that's a very simple, simple uh, rule. So, so we, we had um, several upper continued levels. Uh, we stayed mainly you know, be, below, below what should represent uh, below 250 meters. And, um, and the images started to look much better in order to interpret. So my workflow is very traditional in this sense. I, I, I do you know, um, line tracing manually. manually. But I take advantage of the of populating those interpretations with the data that is coming from the grid. For instance, uh, I trace all the long axes of each anomaly. So I, I mean, most of the anomalies have this, this elongated shape, many of them, and I trace those uh, long anomalies. But I can extract the data. I can extract the values of the mag date of the mag grid or the gravity grid into those into those lines. And then I can classify them. So as you can see there, you have a, uh, the anomaly axis is there. Uh, anything that is five, over 500 nanotesla and in between. So, so we can already start classifying null especially, but also you know, with intensities, um, with, with, uh, with that intensity, intensity rank or scale. Similar thing with the, so that's an, that's an example with Asimov. So this is all GIS work. And a similar thing with the mag destructive lineaments. So I trace manually all the mag destructive lineaments. I use the products that are given. And I think this, this is very difficult. You can replace the tracing, the manual tracing of the interpreter um, just by extracting automatically. Uh, I hope that someone can get, uh, you know, things are getting better in that, but I still think that you can trace, you need to trace it on your I come from a, from a, from a petroleum industry also background, and, um, and Roy Holloway. And, uh, and the, the seismic data that I was exposed to was absolutely great. Best technology, best data. And no one was really trying to replace the seismic reflection interpreter. And, uh, nor in Shell, nor in Exxon. The seismic interpreter is, is, is a person, and it's using the tools of the geophysicists. Like and I think it's, this, is, this is the same thing. It better be because you're not I don't have a job, I guess. But it's true, it's true. So, so Mount Milligan, Mount Poly, copper gold uh, uh, porphyries sitting at the, at, the, at the northern and southern bits, which are more, more relatively exposed, and then this, this covered area. So, so tracing first the anomaly, the, the, the long axis of those anomalies, then the major lineaments, and then tracing magnetic domains which have a similar intensity and a similar texture. And this is what you see there in the, to the right. And then again, I can uh, extract the values from the MAC grid and the graph grid and the DM into those polygons and then classify them by their intensity or frequency. Um, and then uh, the workflow continues, we try to take those anomalies and domains and correlate them with what we know about the geology. So in this case, many of those, uh, over 300, excuse me, over 350 nanotesla um, anomalies do correlate very well with ultramafic rocks, obviously, and with uh, many of the oxidized intrusions. So, so now we're integrating the data with geology and we did this big work of correlating the different units with what we knew from our interpretation. So now we're nailing down this ginormous area into that central, those two central domains. Uh, so we have this Mount Milligan on the north and then uh, uh, Mount Poly to the south and something in between. So we're tracing that we're now nailing down into those, into those domains and that's where we want to stay. The next stage is to see which are the structures that we are really interested in. And for that, we first needed to go to the field. So, 
So we went with Thomas to the field, we spent not so much time, but enough to check that many of these things were absolutely real, many of them were brittle structures, steeply dipping, hosting felsic dikes, mafic dikes, quartz vein, um, in both orientations, in both main orientations, which are origin parallel and origin perpendicular. So loads of extensional faults in that area, although they're not normally represented in mythological maps, but they're there. So, having done that locally, now we can trust much better in the data, and we can make an interpretation on what those ligaments might be if they would be faults. Yeah? So this is what we did. Normally, in this, in this part of the world, in all these or structures which are sub-orthogonal to the origin, the extensional faults. Um, as you can see there, this is a Mount uh, Iglet Lake area. Um, you can see this very nice, this very nice mag anomaly, elongated mag anomaly, big one, and with Eocene and Cretaceous intrusions just sitting on top of that. So that's 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 an easy, like straightforward correlation. But also you can see that those intrusions follow both trends. Yeah? So there's a component of this thrusting, taking thrusting and strike and strike rip fault and taken by by north northwest trending structures, and also the effect of maybe a post collision event. Um, um, with normal faulting orthogonal to to thrust, which is this thing here. <coughs> All right, so uh, now we can make an interpretation of what type of faults they would be, and using the anomaly signals, the magnetic signals to to interpret those as well. So as I said before. Most of the northwest trending structures uh, thrust. Some of them do have offset, the strike slip offsets that we can also pinpoint. And uh, then quite a few northeast trending and east-west trending extension faults. So those intersections are things which are which we, we would pay more attention to. And so that's an example of uh, of uh, of the Mount Poly area. And without them. Uh, this is already 250,000 scales, so we would have to start interpreting again. Everything that we did before is 400,000, and that was the scope of the work. So you can see nicely this, uh, this, 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 this uh, anomaly is just trending in that, in that area there, and this, this is right where we, we wanted to focus here. So we see, us, we see these anomalies all through undercover. So, Areas and, and, and this is where I want to focus around those anomalies. Um, maybe where there's an inflection in those northwest trending, trending structures, maybe where there's an intersection with those northeast trending extension faults, and, uh, and this is of great help when you're working uh, with lead log. All right, so the, the, the next, uh, the next uh, case example follows a very, very similar methodology. Uh, we did this work with Mario Allen, Ricard, Jim Mortensen, and then the U, and also the NBIU, back in 2012 until 2014. And um, we integrated a huge amount of data. There's a new map that came out from that. There was the original map that did have not much structural information, and we have a very nice interpretation. This is also published in a journal which is called the Interpretation. Um, so that's the, the study area. Again, the intermontane terrain, so the Western Cordillera, uh, along the uh, Yukon and Eastern Alaska. And there you have uh, the overall tectonic structural map of the, of the, of the entire uh, Western, uh, Western Canada. Right? So what you see is these long features. This is our, one of the results of this work. So, so you see these long features, which are mainly thrust, Maybe with some sun strike slip components there sitting in within the intermontane terrains, but once you get into the Alaskan border, you start to see all these trending structures. And they have different age, and they control different types of deposit of different age as well. So we compiled most of the geological data that was available. We, we took a student that he traced each uh, published fault uh, and, and digitize every 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 structure that was available, and that's that's what we use also to integrate. So this is that map there, 
we we merge the geology of both sides, the Canadian and the, and the Alaskan side, the Yukon and the Alaskan side, and this is the result. So we needed that layer of structure, and uh, we so we use graph, mag, and the DMs to, to do that and feel work. So because it's an interpretation, everyone can have their own, and most of the critics uh, of line tracing is that uh, anyone can do this thing. So we try to, we really try to put some method methodology into this, and um, and we came out with using the different layers in order to rank our structures. So every time we had or lineaments, every time we had a lineament that we could see in the different data sets, then we would um, add a value to it. So we could create a rank which of these elements might be more keen on being real and false. Yeah. And, and this is what, what we end up with. So, it, first of all, it helps to look into, 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 into this complex array of elements, and it drags your attention into what you want to focus on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we end up focusing, basically, a couple of faults only uh, within this, 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 this mesh of structures. And then again, we took the geology, we used you know, this lead, this, uh, the snorkel line, uh, that's a reflection line, further, a little bit further to the south. So uh, I did a reinterpretation of that, of that uh, published paper. Cool. And what you see there is that most of these structures where we were working at, yeah, they are related to thrusting. The northwest trending structures are related to thrusting. Although you have this massively big striking faults on the boundaries, Within the intermediate range is basically not a southwest virgin thrusting with all the rocks from from the North American margin thrusted over the intermediate range, which were created sometime in the Jurassic. So that's the scenario. Uh, so we use this now to interpret this the possible faults with a with a kinematic or with a fault type. So that's the result. So the map is is. is it's easy to read. Um, we have uh, we have certain certain rules that we also follow to 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 interpret the kinematics of the structures. For instance, uh, it's very common that you see uh, plutons being exhumed in the food wall of normal faults. You now these trending normal faults, plutons being exhumed, basically in the hanging wall. That's what you can see there. The sun strikes strikes very nice nice ones with a with a sinusoidal strike slip slip component like that one that you see there, and then you have the northwest trending ones which are similar to what we we see in the seismic reflection section. Um, yeah, so we compare those structures against the data and we try to simplify the data as much as possible. There you can see just the positive anomalies, the, the positive mag anomalies, so uh, or the high mag anomalies of our data sets and we see mainly that the Jurassic, Jurassic intrusions, intrusions do have a, a nice response you can see them nicely you can, that when, you came into, when you go into the Cretaceous it's way more erratic it's not so oxidized and not, it doesn't show up as nicely but when you go into the grab data although there's way less resolution way less resolution what we see is that we have a mass excess in the the Triassic to the Jurassic Plutons, which is what we see, oh, sorry, what, what you see there. But with the Cretaceous intrusions, it's nicely seen that the light felsic melts. So we end up, um, now we can nail down into maybe two structures that we are interested in, uh, two or three, and uh, in the boundaries of felsic magmas, Cretaceous age, which is mainly, in this case, the Big Creek Fault controls a series of uh, uh, mid-Cretaceous uh, porphyry deposits and then the, some of the northeast trending structures as well which are late, late Cretaceous, mainly polymetallic vein systems so now, now we can just change the scale, I would say and so to that. that's the position, so, so especially the big quick fault is that uh, has, it has a very nice, uh, uh, let's say, geological uh, Spatial uh, geological relation to the Dawson Range intrusions and sitting right there, and it's controlling a series of deposits. It's, uh, it's very close to Casino. The, the coffee system is also at the north, and you have revenue and uh, 
uh, sitting there just in the threshold. We'll talk about that later on. All right, so, so more spatial stuff. Uh, um, we can you know, keep looking at this thing into, into more detail using uh, azimuths and, uh, and again extracting the values from the grid into the lines. And it's a nice, two nice examples. I mean, Two nice examples uh, of uh, magnetite destructive liniments, uh, which are in fact faults that we want to see in the, in the ground, on the ground, uh, that the big big fault and the Ketunchuk fault. And now we can, and this is this is absolutely stunning in my in my my perspective. Well, it has a lot of resolution, and you can do quite a good work there in an area which does not so much help. All right. That's the position of uh, nucleus and revenue. Uh, one of the projects that I visit, and we visit with Marie Allen, is sitting in that lowland valley, uh, just in a in a jog along the fault. And that's our interpretation. So basically, there's a cluster of uh, of occurrences and and, 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 and deposits uh, um, within that bend within that band and within that, that jog system. And a similar, a similar case, well, a similar example, a similar approach to the northeastern structures. So you can see a very nice mag-destructive lineament and a mag addition lineament, probably a mafic dike running through there. And we went to see this on the ground. And then again, you know, the control of, uh, of polymetallic veins was just you know, sitting in the fault zone. So, and we so every band so then then structural geology comes more, more more important here every 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 fold band every you know, uh, complex geometry along strike of the fold might be a good you know a thing to look at closer and um, so these are the kind of interpretations that you can see the graph on the on the on the bottom so you got this low low um, or this, this this low graph where the fault develops and then the high, the, the high magnet, magnetic uh, values uh, also overlapping. So these are the areas that we were most interested in. Those intersections, the high, the, the high magnetic or subortogonal to the fault system sitting on that graph low, for instance. So, to wrap up, I think it's very, very important that there's a, there's, a, there's a concept of what's going on with the geology, what's going on with the structure, what is the tectonic history, geological history of the area. So and that's 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 key. Uh, obviously, you have to understand to understand the basic physical concepts that drive the geological signatures, especially for geologists, which we are not pretending to be geophysicists, but we use the data a lot. Um, so recognize those uncertainty, uncertainties, integrate the geological maps uh, as much as possible with rock parameter data. We did this as well. Uh, didn't touch on that much, but uh, develop these workflows you know, to make those elements uh, uh, and try to rank them in, 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 in any way possible. Uh, obviously, recognition of patterns that that we know the work and, well, as I said before, understanding the tonic setting and geological history of the area, that's, that's, I believe, is definitely key. Uh, all right. And that one. That's obviously in northwestern Canada. Yeah. And that's in northern Chile. But yeah, walk and do geology. Yeah, so we, we, we use the upper continuum levels to see, so that's an interpretation. In the Yukon case, we did one interpretation, one line interpretation for things which should represent the shallow crust, the mid and the So we did that, and then we, over, we stacked those three, and we came up with one map. But we have the, the three different interpretations. Yeah. That's, that's what we have to do. We had the we had the chance to do some. Uh,
well in a number of places. We do a lot of 3D magnetic modeling. And, and in some, I mean, there may be some underlying 3D models available to you, but there's a lot of interesting detail in characterizing intrusives, we find, if you maybe take it to scale down from where you're working. And, and uh, uh, around some of those porphyry systems that uh, occur up there, we noticed that a number of them are in very magnetic environments, and it was quite difficult. Uh, if you say step down into British Columbia, you'll see often discrete magnetic features associated with these porphyries, with some of them. Uh, but up there in the Yukon and parts of Alaska, it seemed to be the whole thing was lighting up. But if you look at your 3D model and you just let it shrink down to a higher and higher susceptibility, you can actually start to see some interesting, call it associated structures of depth that seem to tie in. It's a bit like what Stefan was showing. There's, there's a lot of information in these, in these data sets, and these are not constrained by any means. I mean, we, we're not talking about somebody's gone out and done a lot of surface physical properties or drill hole information. You're just really relying on the, you know, on the, on the good practice of the person who's generated the model to be have some veracity in the geology. But I think what I found was if you look at enough, you know, you, you just don't count on one situation. You have to look population and you can start to build up some confidence but yeah it's a you know you're, you're just at the beginning in a way for this is this is absolutely the beginning I yeah. mean the whole idea was to make to, to give the first pass at the fourth five hundred thousand scale and uh, there's no 3d data so everything is on plan so but it's you know the data is there uh, and it's, it's good to spend the time interpreting it check it out in the field and see if they are real, and then we'll work. Good. Thank you. Any chance for any questions? One once, twice? Good, thank you.